Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's wonderful to be part of such a fascinating symposium, um, to hear such interesting talks and to be celebrating 355 year, 350 years of the University of Lund. So I'm going to talk today um, about work that's been going on in my lab and other labs um, over the last few years, which looks at um, mechanisms of social interaction. Social interaction is something that we're all doing all the time, every day. Um, it's a very dynamic process. You never really have exactly the same social interaction twice. Um, it involves a lot of different systems. You've got motor systems, you've got visual systems, um, you've got language, you've got nonverbal communication, you've got a whole bunch of things happening all at once. So it's a sort of core part of our life and it's pretty tricky to pull this apart and reduce it to the kind of thing that we can fit into an MRI scanner. So I'm gonna try and tell you about some of the attempts that we've been making to do this kind of thing. And I'm focusing particularly on imitation as an example of a social interaction, that we can at least recognize imitation when it happens um, and try and make attempts to um, pin down what kind of things might be going on in imitation. So I'm actually going to start off with an example of a task and then I'll explain afterwards why we're interested in this and what we're trying to study. So this lad here, Spider-Man, is about seven years old and he's taking part in a series of experiments um, in a um, science project and um, he's been told, you're going to see um, Lauren take the duck out of the box and then your job is to get the duck out of the box as fast as you can. So that's the only instruction he's been given. Um, and when the demonstrator does the actions, she does some obvious things like unclip the lid, but she does this silly action of tapping on top of the box. And what we're interested in is whether um, the child dressed as Spider-Man is going to spontaneously copy that silly action. Remember, we've never told him anything about copying. We've just told him, get the duck out of the box as fast as you can. And he very solemnly unclips the lid and taps on top of the box. Um, and we've done this now with um, hundreds of children. This is a very, very common behavior. It's something that we're calling over-imitation. It's when you haven't been told to copy stuff, but you're copying things that you don't need to. Um, and this was initially studied in quite small children, in two, three-year-olds, and with quite complex objects. So people thought it was about le you know, um, learning how to use a complex object. But we've been working with older kids, five to eight-year-olds, and with really, really simple boxes. Every five-year-old knows how a Tupperware lunchbox works. And yet we still find a lot of this over-imitation behavior, even when these are familiar objects. And the amount of over-imitation we get increases when the children are older, it increases if you've got a live demonstrator. We ask the kids afterwards, was this a sensible action or a silly action? And the children who say that it's a silly action, who know it was silly, they're the ones who are more likely to have copied the action. Um, so all of these things suggest that these kinds of imitation um, aren't just you know, l l um, something confined to small children who really don't know what's going on um, with the objects in the world. There's something else. And we think this kind of imitation is an example of maybe the kind of imitation behaviors that you'd see all of the time in everyday life. Um, in England at the moment, in primary schools, every kid has a fidget spinner, one of these little things that spin round and round. That's the fashion this year in primary schools. And, you know, why do we all, why do they all want the same things? Or why do teenagers copy the same fashions from each other? Why do people engage in um, actions where they imitate another person? So that's the kind of core question that I'm interested in um, today that I'm going to try and show you some data about. Why is it that people are such prolific imitators? There is imitation in other species, but it's much, much rarer. Whereas if you go to a nursery full of two and three-year-olds, they're all copying stuff all the time, just spontaneously, just because they do. So why do they do that? Um, and there are kind of two main theories that are out there. I think the dominant theory in the literature 
lecture is that imitation is about learning new skills. Um, I've lost count of the number of scientific papers where sentence number one, imitation is very important for learning things. And if you're an ape learning how to crack a nut, or if you're learning how to do ballet, then imitating um, another person would be a good way to learn that particular skill. But what I want to argue today is that that's really not everything that's going on. That imitation also has a big role in being social and in communicating with others. When the little girl here sees her big sister touch her nose, and she touches her nose, she's not learning anything. She already knows where her nose is, but she just wants to communicate with her sister and play a game and show, I'm like you. I enjoy you know, interacting with you, something like that. Um, so we're going to look at some studies about why do people imitate, what's different about imitation behavior in autism, um, and what can we say about the brain mechanisms that drive this kind of imitation and allow us to imitate. Um, and at the end, I'll try and put some of these ideas together into a neurocognitive model that might tell us something about the, both the brain systems of imitation and how they might process information and fit together. So that's my kind of overall aim for this talk. Um, and think coming back to these two different theories, is imitation for learning or is it for social interaction? These two different theories make different kinds of predictions about what kind of things we might expect in our experiments. If imitation is really about learning about the world, learning about physical objects, then what should matter is the object you've got in front of you. It doesn't really matter what the other people around you are doing. I mean, once you've, one, after you've seen the demonstration, then you can take the object and just use that. Similarly, um, skills and things like using objects tend to be um, intact in people with autism. So if people with autism can get the information, then they ought to be able to use that on an object. And the kind of brain systems that we would expect to be involved, the kind of brain systems that are doing things like learning motor skills. Whereas if we think imitation is much more social, then we would predict that social cues do matter, that imitation um, is going to be very different in people with autism, and that we're going to get social brain systems. So I'm going to talk you through a series of studies that look at these different predictions in different ways. And first of all, we'll start with social cues, and in particular with gaze. If someone looks straight at you, that is one of the most basic, compelling, and socially important cues that is out there. And direct gaze does many, many interesting things. It works as an alerting signal. If eyes are just flashed up at you, even for you know, 10 milliseconds, you can't consciously detect it, that can still activate your amygdala. That can engage components of the social brain. So just direct gaze can have this dramatic and rapid pay attention signal. But gaze also does other things. Gaze can um, lead people into a much more elaborate kind of social thinking, where you're realizing, OK, that's, if that wasn't just a picture, that's a real person. That person's looking at me. What's she thinking of me? Has she noticed what my clothes are today? Has she noticed um, whether or not I'm paying attention? And so direct gaze can lead people to engage in some much more elaborate types of social cognition. Um, and so we've done some studies to look at things like does direct gaze, does being watched change children's imitation behavior? So we had a group of um, primary school children, they're seeing the tapping on top of the box action, but for different children, the experimenter behaved in different ways. So for 26 kids, she showed the action and then walked out of the room. For 30 kids, she showed the action and then turns away and says, now you get the duck out of the box, but I'm going to do something different. And she just turns around. Or for the other kids, she again tells them to get the duck out of the box, but stays directly looking at them. So it's whether the other person is looking at the time when the kid is responding. And that causes a big difference in the rate of imitation. Um, in particular, if the experimenter turns away compared to if she looks at you, we've got a big jump um, that children imitate much more when they're being watched. Um, we can also try and look at these effects in adults. And the task with getting the duck out of the box, it's great fun, but you can only do one or two trials. It doesn't really work very well in adults. So we've got different ways to try and measure imitation behavior in adults. Um, one of the very simple ways we have is a simple reaction time task. So we ask people to make a hand opening movement. 
You start off with your hand like this, and your job is to open your hand as fast as you can whenever you see a hand movement on the screen. So sometimes you see a hand movement that's a hand opening movement, and your job is to open your hand, so the movement you see and the movement you do is congruent. You've got the chance to imitate, if you like, and it's quite fast. On other trials, you see a hand closing movement, but your job is still to open your hand, and people tend to be a little bit slow on those trials. So we measure how fast people respond to the congruent and the incongruent. They're typically faster on the congruent, and that difference between the two is our measure of the tendency to automatically imitate the thing that you're seeing on the screen. Um, and what we found is we can then test, is this tendency modulated by social cues? So if somebody looks directly at you before she makes the hand opening or hand closing movement, does that change how much you imitate? And it's working, yep, it does. So um, participants are faster on the mimicry trials compared to the no mimicry trials, but they're even faster when you get direct eye contact. If someone looks at you, then um, that makes you faster in your imitation response. And we've done some follow-ups to show that it really matters that the person's looking at you at the time when you make your response. Um, so both in children and in adults, we're getting differences in imitation behavior according to the social cue of gaze, according to whether someone else is looking at you. But what does this tell us about autism? Um, we've heard um, a bit about autism already. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder um, affecting um, around about 1% of children. It particularly impacts um, on social interaction and communication. There are many, many, many different theories um, out there and different explanations that people have tried to give of autism. I'm not going to pin down any particular one of them. I'm really using autism here as a test case of here are a group of people who we know struggle with social interaction and are there any consistent effects on the, um, things like their imitation behavior and their sensitivity to social cues. So we give them the same hand mimicry task that I just told you. Um, and first, this is our typical sample where we replicate the effect that we had previously. Whereas in our autism sample, we get a different effect. So the people with autism um, are faster on the congruent trials compared to the incongruent, so they can imitate perfectly well. They're showing just the same imitation effect as typical people. They're faster on the direct gaze compared to the averted gaze. So that means that they get that gaze is a bit of a wow signal. They pay attention to it. It makes them sit up and go a bit faster. But there's no interaction between these two things. They're not using the direct gaze to change how much they imitate. Um, they're just behaving exactly the same way, whether it's an imitation trial um, or a non-imitation trial. So that suggests the difference in the modulation um, of mimicry by gaze. We can also go back to the task with the ducks, because that one's a nice fun one. So here is an example of a child with autism, again, doing a task where you're getting the toy out of the box. In this demonstration, the silly action is going to be sliding the box backwards and forwards across the table. So look out for the demonstrator. She takes a rubber band off the box. She slides the box on the table, which is a silly action. And then she gets out the toy elephant. And again, um, the boy in the yellow t-shirt um, has a diagnosis of autism, and we're asking him to take the elephant out as fast as he can. So there's no messing about. He just goes for it, and he does exactly what we've asked. This is a really fun task because this is one of the points where actually, in a way, the kids with autism are doing better than the typically developing children. The kids with autism are doing exactly what they asked. They get the elephant out, and they're not being distracted by all of this extra social stuff that we're putting on, whereas the typically developing children are taking longer to do the task because they're being distracted by our extra things of tapping on top of the box and sliding stuff about and all of this other nonsense that we put in there. Um, so you can argue that here, at least, the autistic kids are smarter. Um, and this is just the results from the group analysis, because you shouldn't believe it when I show you just one pretty video. You should be saying, where's the data? And so here's the data, 30 kids with autism, 30 controls match for chronological age, 30 match for verbal mental age, and a whacking great difference in the level of um, over-imitation behavior in the autistic sample. So coming back to my hypothesis about why do we imitate, we're trying to evaluate this idea that we're imitating 
in order to socially interact with other people. Um, and we predicted that we'd have effects on, of gaze, and we find that that's true both in children and in adults. The social cues, and in particular the eye contact you're getting from another person, really does make a difference to imitation behavior. And we predicted there would be differences in autism, and again, we see that both in the children um, and in the adults on these two different tasks. So we've got a nice consistent pattern in terms of imitation behavior, but what about brain systems? What do we know about the brain systems that are allowing us to do this kind of imitation? And there are two main candidate brain systems that we're going to be talking about today. The first one is some social brain systems. And imagine you're lying in an MRI scanner, and you're going to watch this video. And as you watch it, think in your head about the story. Think about what's actually going on in this video. So we've got the little red triangle, um, and there's no one there. I've gone back in the house. <laughs> so even though this is just, there's no people here, this is just triangles moving about on the screen. But as you watch it, it becomes very easy to tell a bit of a social story about um, the little triangle is knocking at the door and hiding and playing a trick. Um, and so even from very simple things, we can start to tell social stories. Um, and engaging these kind of social processes engages some specific brain regions when you stick people in an MRI scanner, and in particular, uh, medial prefrontal cortex and temporal parietal junction, but I'm going to be focusing on medial prefrontal cortex today. So this is an area that we know is very much involved in um, understanding social stimuli. We also know that it responds to direct eye contact, and it responds to thinking about yourself, thinking um, about if particular words or ideas apply to yourself compared to other people. Um, so it's a pretty sort of social and high-level self-related area of the brain. Um, a different area that might also have a pretty important role in um, imitation performance is um, what's sometimes called the mirror neuron system. Um, so that's a set of brain areas um, here in inferior frontal gyrus and anterior interparietal sulcus or inferior parietal lobule. And these brain areas contain mirror neurons. So mirror neurons were first discovered in the macaque monkey by Rizzolatti and colleagues. And they were recording, doing single unit recordings in the inferior frontal gyrus to look at brain systems for controlling hand actions. So the monkey will be reaching out and picking up a peanut and you're looking to see what brain systems um, are involved in that control of the precision grasp. So here's the monkey picking up a peanut, and each line along here is a raster to record in a single trial when does the neuron make a spike, when does it fire, which are the blue bits, and then this plot here is just when you add them all together, and so we can see that there's a nice strong pattern of neural firing in this area of premotor cortex when the monkey picks up a peanut. And that was all pretty widely expected because we knew that this was a motor control area to do with skill control of hand actions. The surprising thing that Rizzolatti and colleagues found um, was that if the monkey saw the experiment to pick up a peanut, then the same neurons also fired in the same area. Um, and they did quite a lot of testing with these um, and named them mirror neurons. It's kind of quite a provocative name and suggested that this is a core mechanism of social interaction, something that allows you to solve really the quite complex problem of linking the image of another person's hand, the visual image of the hand on the retina, to the motor commands that you need to reach out and do an action. That's not a trivial problem to solve. And yet these mirror neurons seem to be solving that problem or to have some kind of a solution to that problem. 
So they were initially discovered in macaque monkeys, and with a whole bunch of newer imaging studies, we've got a pretty good idea that there were equivalent systems in humans. So inferior frontal gyrus and anterior intraparietal in an MRI scanner will respond if you observe actions, if you perform actions, if you imitate actions. Um, so they seem to be very important for understanding what another person can do, but also for your own motor system, for controlling your own kind of hand actions. Um, so what we were interested in, in the context of imitation, is um, what are these brain systems doing um, in imitation tasks, and in particular in the kind of imitation tasks that I've been presenting um, today, because we've got the mirror neuron systems that might have a role in things like imitation learning. If you learn to play the guitar off something that looks a bit like this, seeing another person's fingers, you'll be using these kind of brain systems. Whereas the medial prefrontal cortex um, responds to social cues like eye contact. So how do these things work together to let us do this kind of social imitation? Um, so we put our participants in an MRI scanner and again had them do this hand action task where they um, have direct gaze and averted gaze and hand opening and hand closing movements. Um, and we find activation in three brain systems, so a medial prefrontal cortex, but also an inferior frontal gyrus and um, superior temporal sulcus, another area that we know inputs um, to these two areas. Um, we can use some connectivity analysis to then get some models of how these brain areas might connect together. And this gives us a picture where um, medial prefrontal cortex has solid arrows coming down to the other two. That means medial prefrontal is the one that's acting as a controller. It's influencing the other two brain systems. And when we have this interaction, that's our change in behavior with the eye contact, then that interaction changes the strength of the connection from medial prefrontal cortex down to STS. So this computational modeling can really give us a picture of how these brain areas connect together and work together um, in this kind of dynamic task. Um, but that study just had typical participants. We also want to know a bit about what's going on in these brain areas in people with autism. So we had another study, um, just an observation study, where we have adults um, with autism and match typical adults in our MRI scanner. And they were just lying in the scanner watching movies. Their job is just stay awake and watch the movie. And there's several different types of movie that we had them watch. So first of all, we have them watch movies of rational, ordinary actions. If you're reaching out to pick up an apple here, you typically do that just reaching your hand in a straight line. That's the regular way to pick up an apple. But we also want something that's similar to that study where you're tapping on top of the box, where it's a bit of a silly way to do the action. And we use here these curved actions. So you reach out to pick up the object, but using a curved trajectory. And to make these movies, we actually had to put an invisible thread across and tell our actor, you've got to move over this invisible thread. Because it's kind of hard to do this consistently if there's nothing there and as a barrier in the way. Um, and so... Participants watch rational actions, irrational actions, and then on other trials, some shapes that slowly drift across the screen. They're not very social. Um, and we can look at a couple of different contrasts here. First of all, we can look at just seeing hand actions compared to seeing shapes. And here we find that the parietal cortex shows exactly the same pattern of activation in our typical participants and in those with autism. So the turquoise on the plots here is the overlap between the brain activation for the typical and the autistic participants. They're both showing just the same pattern of brain activity. Um, whereas if we make a different contrast, if we contrast the irrational actions against the rational actions, then we find activation here in the medial prefrontal cortex. So we're getting um, a difference between the autistic participants and the typical participants just in the social brain areas that seem to be concerned with understanding the fact that this action is a silly action, is an unusual way to do things. Um, and so we can now... Put all, try and put these different results together um, into a kind of model of what kinds of information processing do we think is happening in the brain um, in, in, in the context of social interaction and imitation. And there's kind of two components to this model. The first component is a visual motor stream. So this is going through the mirror system where you see an action 
and you've got to decide what's the possible action that you could do in response to that. And there's many, many um, studies suggesting that for non-social actions, you can um, you see the different objects that are around in front of you, the things that you could pick up in the world, and all the time you're computing what are the possible actions that I could do, and you use this kind of visual motor stream to work out what are the actions that are available to me that I could do in the world, and then to select between them. And similarly for social actions, um, if there's different people in front of you, you could work out different social actions. Here's a person I haven't met before. Shall I go and shake hands with them? Shall I give them a kiss on the cheek? Or shall I run away as fast as I possibly can? Um, and so all the time you can compute different possible social actions. Some of these are going to be imitative actions. If someone reaches out to shake hands with you, it would probably be a good idea to reach out your hand too and um, shake hands with them. But others might be um, non-imitative actions. If someone is trying to punch you, you might put your hand up um, to parry them somehow. So um, this visual motor stream is going to do imitative actions, but not just that. It probably does a bunch of other stuff too. But what we think um, from the studies that I've just presented is that you've also got this wide variety of possible actions in the world, and you've got to be selective. You can't do all of these things all at once. You've got to choose between the different actions that are available to you. And we think it's prefrontal cortex, and in the context of social actions, in particular medial prefrontal cortex, that implements this kind of top-down control that lets you decide out of all of these different actions, which one is the appropriate one to do right now? Um, and we also think that it's that sort of social decision-making of what things should I do next? Should I imitate right now? Should I not imitate? That's the thing that people with autism may particularly struggle with. We know that it, they can do imitation when they're instructed. If we tell the autistic kids, copy now, then they'll do it just fine but they're not spontaneously copying in a way that's determined by the social situation because they're not using the social cues in the same way. Um, so that's the kind of cognitive model that we've got to at the moment, and we're working to test that and refine that in various ways. Um, just to summarize um, the question I talked about at the beginning about why do we imitate, um, I think we're getting increasing evidence that the social type of imitation is really, really important. That's actually what dominates our everyday life much more than learning. Social cues matter for typically developing children. The response to those differs in the children with autism, and we can see that it's social brain systems that are critical for imitation um, in adults and that are different um, in people with autism. So the implications of this um, really is that we need to understand imitation in terms of selective motor control, and we need to understand the social types that maybe um, people imitate in order to affiliate with others or in order to bond with others. Um, I love this example that I got um, off the web of the little girl shaving, because that's not a skill she needs to learn. She doesn't ever need to know to learn to shave her cheek, but she wants to imitate her dad because she wants to be like her dad. Um, and she wants to, you know, play play at that game of being another person or show an affiliation for another person. Um, and that the implications in terms of autism and learning um, is that kids with autism can, Im can imitate. There are many times when children with autism imitate far too much. They will have echolalia and echopraxia. They copy things that they're not meant to copy. So they can copy, but we need to help them understand when is it a good time to copy and when it is a bad time to copy, and how you should distinct how to use different kinds of social cues to tell a difference between those. Um, well, as I say, doing a lot more work on this, and in particular, um, most of what I've shown you today is work where we're using traditional things like MRI scanners, which are pretty limited in terms of social interaction. You can't really have people do much more than a simple hand action in an MRI scanner. Um, and we want to get better experimental control and better things um, that are going out into the real world. We're using brain imaging methods like functional low infrared spectroscopy, which lets you shine light into the head, capture the light reflected back, and that gives you a measure of blood flow. It's a fairly crude measure, 
but you can put on this hat and you could walk around Lund and see what your prefrontal cortex is doing while you walk around the streets and have conversations with people, which is a pretty incredible um, technology. And we're using things like augmented reality and motion capture to get much finer um, measures of how people imitate um, and how that imitation has changed in different contexts. So um, do watch this space for the developments that are coming out in this area in the near future. But for now, I want to say thank you to all of the people in my lab who've collected this data, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Hamilton. I realize I am missing my beautiful catch box, so it's probably somewhere out in the audience still. Oh, it's right there. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir, for holding it for us. Um, do you want to ask a question? <laughs> no, not right now. OK, anybody else wants to ask a question? OK, think about it, because you'll get another chance in a minute. Um, I was wondering if you can identify sort of the social areas in the brain. Mm -hmm. Like, this is, where we, this is where we work when we imitate and when yeah. we take social cues. Mm -hmm. Does the, would this potentially also mean that we could develop some type of a stimulation system mm -hmm. so we could make, for example, autistic people more mm -hmm. socially able. Would that be technically possible, you think? I mean, there are, there are various brain stimulation systems with transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial electrical stimulation things, but they're incredibly crude mm. because there's millions of neurons here and you can just whack them with TMS and make somebody's arm jerk off. Mm. But I don't think at the moment any of those non-invasive systems are going to have anything like the precision that you need. I think the thing that's going to be much more interesting is to find behavior behavioral training programs that activate these um, cortical areas and you know, ways to target your learning and develop um, training and teaching things that are going to activate these areas and give people more practice at using them in the right ways. Um, mm. Right. Um, hands in the air? No? Just give me them when, when you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> um, I wonder too, you did point out how the children, mm -hmm. uh, the child with autism was actually much more practical and really yes. did the job in a better way yeah. in this particular experiment. Yes. Um, does this say anything about um, like jobs or, mm -hmm. or s that, that might be suitable for people with, uh, with a certain degree of autism. Like, mm -hmm. okay, so this is something that we, to not take an unnecessary social cue yeah. could actually be an advantage. Can we learn yes. something from this? That's what I'm after. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly there are many attempts out there to match people with autism to jobs that they're going to enjoy that tend to be jobs that don't have much social interaction, whether it's computer programming or working in a library or something that's quite repetitive and structured and doesn't involve dealing with lots of different people. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly there are situations where it's helpful to not be distracted um, by other people and all of these social cues and to not be going out there and following the fashion of what everybody else does, but to do your own thing. Um, so yeah, a, a little bit of you know being distinctive may be may certainly be helpful. Mm, certainly. Um, I was also wondering, um, do you know anything about what is believed uh, about like the evolutionary process of mm -hmm. ending up here? That yeah. it might be practical to imitate to learn is mm -hmm. rather obvious. Yes. And you said that also other animals do that. Yeah. But the whole imitation for socializing, that must mm. have come about in some way. There must have been an evolutionary uh, pressure to do this. What do we know about that? Um, to be honest, not very much. There's been an enormous argument over the evolution of mirror neurons. Um, so the um, Rizzolatti's group and the people who originally discovered mirror neurons put this forward as these things have evolved in order to allow us to imitate and these are a critical adaptation for social interaction. But um, Celia Hayes and others have done really some fantastic work that I think pretty much knocks that on the head and suggests that mirror neurons come from learning. They come from general learning mechanisms. So just in the same way that I learn to control my own hands. So when a baby is born, they don't know what this, the hand is at the end of their arm. And over the first six months of life, they spend an enormous amount of time and energy learning to control their own hand. Mm -hmm. And a side effect of that, a bonus, is that 
you also learn a bit about other people's hands because the shape of my hand is pretty similar to the shape of other people's hands. Um, and so babies you know, learn and develop um, the ability to imitate over the first year of life. Um, they're not born with it. Um, so we know quite a lot about um, that learning is really important in basic mechanisms of imitation, but in terms of the um, role of social cues, we know much, much less. Um, and certainly I don't, we know that, um, for example, eyes are um, unique in humans in that we have much more white in our eyes and um, it's much easier for us to follow gaze of a human um, compared to different apes and monkeys. Their eyes tend to be all black. You can't really tell very easily what direction they're looking in. So they can't use gaze as a social cue in the same kind of way. And direct gaze is often an aversive cue um, in many non-human species. Whereas in humans, direct gaze is a really, really complex cue. In some contexts, direct gaze is aversive because if there's a scary person looking at you, you probably want to get away. Mm -hmm. And in other contexts, direct gaze is what makes you fall in love. So it, it does everything and we just don't know how. Hmm. Yes, the whole part with the direct gaze was quite fascinating, I thought. But there was something, one thing that confused me. I don't know if I got that right. That mm -hmm. was the picture you showed where uh, the, the research leader yeah. would, uh, would be either leaving mm -hmm. or watching or yes. turning away, yes. right? While mm -hmm. a child, I think, yes. was going to was perform doing. some yes. type of task. Uh, now, the way I remember the figures, so the way mm -hmm. I took them down, it seemed that it was more similar, was that right, that if mm -hmm. the research leader um, looked straight ahead and yes. it looks like the exactly. same thing happens if she's not there and if yes. she's looking, but something, yes. sim something so that, different. That was Why something that? that surprised us. And I didn't want to go into the detail of it because most of the previous studies have just compared walking out of the room to being there right. and found no difference. They said, oh, there's no social effect. The thing is, in the context in which our study is done, you know, the child's in the school, it's rare that an adult will walk out of the room and then not come back. The child knows that the adult is going to pop back through the door any minute. So I think the child still feels like they're being monitored. Ah. Whereas when the ex person deliberately turns away, that's a really clear-cut signal. I'm not interested in you. I'm not watching you. I'm not monitoring you. Um, and so I think in that case, the child is much more free to not bother to do the action. Right. Um, so but that is that a bit of a post hoc explanation we, um, yeah. for what... For but it's an interesting here. one, though. So if you don't mm -hmm. have anyone there, you know that they might come back and check on how you do the job at well, any minute. Especially but if they're turning away, they're obviously yeah. just interested in the results and not how you do it. Exactly. exactly. Especially in the context of this experiment. You know, the, the child does three or four trials with these boxes, and each time the experimenter gets up and walks out of the room and then comes back in again two minutes later. So, oh. you know, you, you know that they're still the adult is notionally still there, mm. I think. Right. OK. Um, Interesting. Thank you. Um, last chance. Any questions? Then I say a huge thank you to Dr. Antonia Hamilton thank for you. being here.